Welcome back, everyone. Um, my name is Sanneke Stichter, and I have the pleasure to host this session on changing roles. Um, after each of the presentations, there's a short uh, moment of time for questions. Please uh, drop them in the Q&A box on your screen. We're going to start with Agata Jacek. Agathe is Associate Time-Based Media Conservator at the Salomon R. Guggenheim Museum in New York and is Director of her own studio for video conservation. Agathe, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sanika. Let me share my screen with everybody. All right, can you see it? Perfect. Thank you so much. So yeah, thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, in preparation of this conference, Martina Penninger and I uh, look back, shared memories of how we started and realized how much had changed in the past 20 years. So I want to rewind time for you, look back together with you on the history of modern materials and media and of video art preservation and share one or two personal memories. And I also want to honor the many, many pioneers in the preservation of media art on whose shoulders we stand today. But let's jump back in time first. It's 1999, the legendary video artist and filmmaker Steve McQueen is awarded the prestigious Turner Prize. In Amsterdam, the State League Museum has the 17th Worldwide Video Festival and the Bonner Kunstverein opens a video art exhibition titled Rewind to the Future. And I was not aware of any of these events. So after four years of painting and sculpture conservation as a student and pre-program intern, I had a great desire for something new and joined my fellow students, Dörte Döring and Uli Stürmer, in enrolling for this new program called Modern Materials and Media. And I'm so grateful we went on this journey together. Being the first generation came with a lot of excitement, freedom and improvisation. So um, thanks to Barbara Spallinger and Stefan Wolfert, a laser disc from the local Museum of Communication became my first media conservation object. And this laser disc came with a head crash and was considered to be unplayable. So as we had no laser disc player, remember I said improvisation, I did what we were always doing for understanding an object. I looked really, really closely at it with the help of a microscope and first, I did not grasp what exactly I saw and why I saw it, but I fell in love with video immediately. I wanted to know more and started to visit classes on video art history and technology. And that's how I got to know Johannes Quella. At that point, I had no idea on which foundations we were already standing, how much research had been done and published by so many experts in the field. So, my first major exposure to the international research on the preservation of media art um, in museums took place in February 2001 during the already cited conference um, Zwischen Flut und Flüchtigkeit. But before I dive deeper, let me rewind more in time and shed a light on how conservators entered the field of video preservation, what expectations have been addressed to our field and how our role within this sector changed over time. When I look back now and study the rich, rich literature we have at hand, I see how strongly our field relies on the first pioneers, which were all not conservators. The conservation of video art began when the first open reels tapes started to become sticky. As early as the late 1970s and early 1980s, there were initial projects and efforts to secure and, as it was often called, restore videotapes. These early efforts concentrated on the physical treatment of tapes. Artist Tony Conrad published his first attempts of re-lubricating a sticky tape amongst others in The Independent in 1987, which was a journal of the Association of Independent Video and Filmmakers. From the early 1990s on, the first conferences on the preservation of video and video artworks took place. They foremost addressed the problems associated with degradation and wear and tear of the videotapes in these collections. In 
one, the New York based Media Alliance together with the New York State Council on the Arts organized a conference with over 60 participants from North America who met at the Museum of Modern Art. The attendees were artists, activists, catalogers, curators, distributors, and librarians who discussed the issues of video preservation. At that point, conservators were not involved yet. In the resulting publication, one of the heading reads, Conservation Technology, which focuses on equipment like TBC, on solutions for tape cleaning, on the degradation mechanisms of magnetic tape, as well as on questions on the longevity of formats, both tape-based as well as optical discs. Interestingly, at that time, the transfers of tapes were also referred to as reformatting, especially when a signal enhancement with the help of a TVC was involved. During this conference, artist Con uh, Tony Conrad addressed how to assess a collection when tapes will not play, which shows us how widely early open reels as well as pneumatic sets were affected by degradation. One of the early advices given, and let me cite Deirdre Boyle here, oh, apologies, um, one of the simplest techniques practiced for maintaining a video collection has been to rewind or exercise tapes, which is followed by a semi-annual, annual, occasional, or uh, which is followed on a semi-annual, annual, occasional, or infrequent basis. Only a few years later, Peter Edelstein will write, there is a disagreement about the merits of periodic rewinding or exercising of the tapes. So Deirdre Boyle published the outcomes of this conference in short summarizing articles in 1991 in the Independent on the left side here, as well as an extensive publication, including glossary and addresses of the time in 1993. Two years later, in 1995, German conservator Bärbel Otterbeck hosted a conference titled How Durable is Video Art at the Kunstmuseum Wolfsburg in Germany. Together with Christian Scheidemann, they reflected on how much groundbreaking work has been done by other disciplines, and they looked up to the past publications and conferences in the US. In their foreword, both stayed, when handling conventional artworks, the restorer is primarily concerned with the physical substance of the original, but the conservation of video art demands a new examination of the original's meaning. How can we salvage this particularly transient medium as an expression of our television age for the 21st century? Their book is one of the early published testimonies of conservators taking over responsibility for their time-based media art collection. At the same time, on the other side of the pond, preparation work took place for the Playback 96 conference. It was hosted by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. This conference targeted the needs of conservators. Most major archives, museum and libraries have video collections, but unfortunately there is no strategy for working with videotape and there is no planned comprehensive effort to develop specialists in video conservation. Part of the hesitation stems from art conservators unfamiliarity with video technology because video is relatively a relatively new art form. Conservators have just begun to become acquainted with it. And we couldn't state it more clearly than Sally Jo Pfeiffer and Luke Hounds did. Preserving video art requires nothing less than a new discipline within the field of conservation. Again, one year later, we, had, uh, we saw the groundbreaking conference Modern Art to Cares, which so strongly impacted our thinking around conservation ethics for contemporary artworks, thanks to the decision-making model and the numerous interesting case studies. The year 2000 came with a number of symposia organized um, and led by conservators jointly with other disciplines. Tape degradation was not entirely overcome, but the focus shifted to a more holistic understanding of the artwork and aesthetics, functionality, and meaning of equipment, and the factor of time came into play. So we had tech archaeology, which was already cited a few times today. Um, there was also the Variable Media Initiative. There was the conference Video Arts in Museums at the Museum Ludwig Cologne. And there was um, Flut und Flüchtigkeit uh, between uh, flood and volatility. So 
this year, 2001, marked my last year as a student, as well as my first attendance of a conference entirely um, devoted to the preservation of video or broader time-based media art. I remember sitting in the audience, still a student, and trying to wrap my head around Jim Lindner's presentation on compression for video and the impact of compression on video art. It was the first time I had heard in depth about digitization of video, about the pros and cons of compression. I was in doubt that an art form like video art, which I just had started to appreciate with its different aesthetics, qualities, with its variety of technical properties, should be preserved by one single solution, digitization. So I wanted to prove to myself uh, whether digital could really become something that can be copied lossless. And that the proof became my diploma thesis and taught me a lot about trade transfers. So from today's point of view, the skepticism about digitization might seem incomprehensible, but to remind those who have not witnessed this time consciously, digitization at the time meant in most of the cases, a transfer onto a digital tape. Computer processes, computer interfaces, as well as hard disk drives were just not fast enough to ingest, for example, uncompressed standard definition video. It was still the time of USB 1, and then FireEye 400 came, and HDDs with a size of 120 gigabyte were a luxury. So beginning of 2002, I started to work at a little Swiss production facility for artists, which is simply called Video Company. There were no jobs for media conservators at the time. There was, um, you know, and I was excited to work with and for artists. So the job was so multifaceted. One day I was part of a film production team. Uh, the other day I worked as a technician in the galleries and, you know, and I was able to do more than a thousand tape transfers within years. So at that time, when I started, digital better come decks were still too expensive for such a small video co-op as like us. So we were proud to have a workflow for the production of DVDs in place. We shared software and hardware to burn us authoring DVDs as we called, as they were called at the time. For the production of preservation masters, we preferred to not use compressed digital formats, but as was called at that time to stay in the system and produce a professionally analog copy onto better SP. That came with a generation loss, but that was a hard, um, but that was hard to be quantified. As all of the transfers were tape-based, we compared the original materials with newly produced copies and two monitors next to each other, which in most cases already had a slight deviation in color and other adjustments. So, and then, you know, the price tag was immense. We expected those digital tapes to have a lifetime of seven years and some collections considered that to be too costly and stick to analog copies for some more time. So thanks to the diploma thesis, I had proved to myself that digital tapes um, were the format to go for. But we understood that digitization is an important moment and an artwork's lifetime, and all the artifacts like dropouts, debris, or maladjustment of the player would become inseparably from the content. To make sure that preservation masters are adequate representatives of the work, we were watching hours and hours of video with eyes and ears wide open. And here you see Martina Penninger and me watching um, 131 tapes of a Dieter Roth installation. And we felt really connected to Dieter Roth after that project. But we also wanted to set a new standard in documentation and noted all artifacts diligently. Although our time codes were an approximation, only as we noted them live. A couple of years later, Fire-based digitization had become possible with the introduction of faster spinning hard disk drives, new interfaces like FireWire 800 and so on. However, hard disks were not bigger than a terabyte. So we digitized onto hard disk drives, recorded files back on tape and deleted the files. So it was, you know, digital better come was undoubtedly a great standard, but it came also with a downside, artists naturally could not afford digital better come decks, so they had to trust a vendor to create a good quality master for them. And collections had no digital better come deck either, so they had to trust the artist or the gallery that the master was correct and well done. 
there are many interesting incidents to tell, but I think of the greater losses of that time is that we have only a vague idea about the artist's production processes. What is now common practice, interviewing the artist up in purchase of a work was not a standard then. After seven exciting years, I decided to quit. I really wanted to be a conservator only, but there were still no jobs, jobs. So no museum or collection saw, saw the necessity of hiring a media conservator on staff. I founded my own little studio. Joanna Phillips had reached out and asked me to join working on image areas and analog video. And a few years later, I joined Bern University and had the great pleasure of teaching so many talented students. It was great to share and learn together with all of you. So during the first two decades of the century, video conservation saw fast paced development, storage and computing power increased, prices dropped, and so we are now able to ingest and store digital files. And artist practice has shifted. And so two years ago, I joined the Guggenheim and keep on working on the established acquisition policies that embrace artist practice. We now ask artists for native masters, for exhibition copies, but also for preservation masters, documenting the artist's working environment and respecting their requirements and preferences on aesthetics, format choices, et cetera, guarantees us to collect artworks more truthfully. So thanks to the collaboration with other communities, new free and open source tools tailored to our needs have been developed. Our conservation community thrives. There is more and more publications, more joint efforts, and we have built an international network, which still has a lot of loose ends, but I'm very hopeful that we can bridge those gaps and make new connections. I want to end this talk looking ahead and expressing how grateful I am for all the conservators and non-conservators who have been shaping our thinking profoundly and helped our dis discipline to thrive. Thank you so much. <laughs>